The Rapid Access Blackout Clinic is a response to the relatively confused general approach to the patient with a blackout. We are attempting in the triage clinic to take all comers with transient loss of consciousness or blackout and to do some simple things really, really well before getting a good idea of whether this might be a cardiac disturbance, a neurological disturbance or a psychological disturbance. Yes, we started our, our own Rapid Access Blackouts Clinic, which I think is the first such clinic in the world at the time, in 2007. The process of, of d d delivering these interviews is when you boil it down to uh, interviewing a patient, reading the ECG, and then getting a bit of advice from somebody more senior. Something that is very much deliverable by a specialist nurse who has some cardiac training and ideally some uh, arrhythmia training. Having said that, other nurses can do this because of their background experience and in our first uh, five years we have had an arrhythmia nurse specialist, a falls nurse specialist and an epilepsy nurse specialist working in our rapid access blackouts triage clinic. Now they can't work independently uh, because they're not trained practitioners and certified practitioners so we have a, an SAS grade, middle grade uh, cardiologist supervising the clinic or alternatively myself and some of the registrars working with me. There is another essential function of the rapid access blackouts triage clinic and that is not about so much about diagnosis but about risk. Could this patient walk out of the hospital and drop dead because something's been missed? And there are many examples where this has happened in the past. Uh, that, for example, epilepsy has been diagnosed when in fact the long QT syndrome was inadvertently missed. So we set up within our interview 10 questions, parcel fail questions or red flag questions as we call them, which were designed to assess risk. And these included five questions on cardiovascular, symptom signs and findings, and three questions or four questions on neurological symptom signs and findings. And they are built into the interview that each patient gets. I <coughs> took the view uh, early on that um, the ECG was more likely to be telling in uh, likelihood of diagnostic um, finding than an exhaustive examination of the patients and so forth. So what we tend to do is the detailed uh, questionnaire followed by an ECG. The reason for this is because if you look back through the published literature in medical journals, you will clearly see that these are the things that give rise to the highest level of accurate diagnosis. Talking to the patient, getting a good history, talking to witnesses and checking the ECG. Of course, if any of the findings are abnormal, or there's a strong suspicion, for example, that the heart's not normal, there's a valve problem, etc., then further tests are automatically done. We've accumulated quite a big experience, uh, about 1,500 patients to date, and we have had some, uh, some early uh, follow-up data. Uh, the initial findings on 320 patients suggested that we could, by these techniques, identify the low risk and the high risk patients very, very well, and suggested that we were at least as good as other series in the published literature at getting a diagnosis for our patients in this group of patients. The one other thing that I can add to that is uh, how, the, how robust these techniques are in the longer term. Again, if we look at those first 320 odd patients, over a four-year follow-up, the initial findings appear to stay 
uh, to, to remain true that we have picked the right diagnosis and we've applied the right treatment. So I think this is a good way using uh, relatively inexpensive resources of making sure that patients with blackouts get a proper assessment.